Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the previous few examples, we've done WH movement of elements from object position. But now we should talk about what goes on when you have a WH question that involves a subject, because the pattern is slightly different with subjects. So when we um, are uh, looking at objects, um, you get clear instances of subject aux inversion. Well, what happens with a uh, WH subject? You don't get um, anything that looks like subject aux inversion. Part of the reason of this, of course, is because you're moving the subject into the, uh, into the specifier of the CP, so that's going to put it before the inverted auxiliary. But look at these two sentences we have here. Normally, when you do WH movement and you have subject aux inversion, you get do insertion. So what did Bill eat? You get did eat, did, um, what did Bill eat? You get that did in here. But when you have a WH uh, subject, you don't get do insertion. So you don't get who did eat uh, the beef waffles. You get who ate the beef waffles. So there appears to be no evidence at all for subject aux inversion. Um, now, the other thing is, there's no real evidence that you have WH movement. Because if you look at the, surf, the simple surface string, who and Calvin are in exactly the same position relative to the rest of the clause. So when we looked at um, WH objects, we knew there was movement because when the word was in object position, it was in one position. And when it was a WH question, it was in a completely different position. Here, they're in the same position. So we can ask the real question, is there evidence for a WH movement here? Um, now, the answer to this is, yes, there is, but you have to probe a little deeper. So take, for example, what happens if you put an embedded clause into uh, a structure and you question the subject of that embedded clause. So we have Alicia said Calvin ate the beef waffles. If we turn Calvin into a question word like who, we get clear WH movement. We have who did Alicia say ate the beef waffles, where we've moved from this position between said and ate, and we've moved it up to the front of the sentence. So there are occasions when subjects um, uh, subject WH questions clearly involve movement. So that's one piece of evidence. The other piece of evidence comes from languages that use overt WH complementizers that we talked about uh, before. So here's an example from Scottish Gaelic, and Scottish Gaelic has a WH complementizer just like Irish did in the previous, ex uh, the previous set of videos. And um, so this element here marks the specif this marks the head of the CP, and we see that when we have a subject question, as in who ate the beef waffles, um, you know, he, um, Calvin the break and the uh, we clearly have WH movement. First of all, uh, the subject has moved from after the verb which is the normal position of subjects in Scottish Gaelic, it's a VSO language, to the front of the sentence. And secondly, we have this WH complementizer, which tells us that precisely that this who word is in the specifier of the CP. So that shows us that uh, in other languages, uh, we clearly have evidence that uh, WH subjects move as well. So we have evidence from English embedded clauses and other languages that WH subjects do move, despite the fact that in English uh, it, you can't see that in the simple straightforward um, word order, because in English uh, the WH subjects appear in exactly uh, look like they appear in exactly the same position as uh, non-WH subjects. So there's a couple of solutions to this problem. One, one solution is to say that um, 
English uh, has the has the strange property that exceptionally there's no WH movement from subject positions in main clauses, um, but there is WH movement from in English embedded clauses and in other languages. So we could simply claim that English uh, main clauses uh, are strange. Um, there is an alternative, which is to claim that there uh, is movement in English. But because of the linear order effects, the uh, word order doesn't shift. So uh, you're doing structural movement, but because things are in uh, relatively the same order that they would be in in statements, um, then, then you actually don't see it. We, this kind of movement, where you do movement, uh, but you actually don't see any evidence of it on the surface is called vacuous movement because you're moving from one position to another but it doesn't actually shift the word order or the overt morpholo morphology you see. There is still one quirk that we have to explain which is why you don't get due support in those contexts. Now neither of these uh, solutions is particularly satisfying but uh, we're going to adopt the latter one which is that you always do WH movement of WH phrases. Um, uh, and we do this because uh, presumably WH uh, questions that involve subjects still have a plus uh, WH complementizer phrase. That is, they are still typed as questions. So we want that CP to have that plus WH feature so that it is correctly typed as a question. Um, but then the movement you do, you don't actually see any, um, you don't see any surface uh, ordering uh, shift from it. Um, there's room for debate here, uh, but that that solution is just going to make our system more consistent. Let's do a derivation to uh, see how this would work. So the structure we are going to um, we're going to tree is who baked the beef waffles, and uh, our D structure, our structure before we do any movement. Uh, the structure that is subject to the theta criterion actually already has this order. Uh, who You can see this right here, who baked the beef waffles. But um, we're going to want to move some stuff around here in order for this tree to be consistent with the principles that we've imposed in other kinds of sentences. So let's take... Um, the features we have and sort of check to make sure that all the constraints that we've proposed are met and what kinds of movement we would have to do to derive the sentence and make sure it also still results in the correct word order. So the first thing we have to check is the theta criterion. The theta criterion uh, here uh, is met the same way as the uh, for the sentence we looked at in video 12.2. Um, we have a voice phrase which introduces the agent and takes a VP complement. Um, and the agent here is who. And we have a, a, a lexical verb baked that takes a theme complement, which is represented here by the DP uh, beef waffles. So who is getting its external theta role in the specifier of voice phrase? And beef waffles gets its internal theme role uh, for, as the complement to the verb the theta criterion is met. Okay, the next thing we have to do is account for the plus Q feature here. Um, now, normally we would do do insertion. Um, the fact that we don't do do insertion in this situation is a puzzle and a stipulation. Uh, so in the video 12.2, when we did an object uh, WH movement, we stuck a do into this position and then moved it. We didn't do that here. Why that is, is a bit of a mystery. But we would normally do T to C movement when we have a plus Q. So I'm doing it here, but I'm moving a null element into another null element. So that has no effect on uh, the surface order of elements because uh, both of these are null and you're not going to hear them anyways. But doing that allows us to check off the Q feature. Okay, the case features. So um, you'll recall from the previous video, 
uh, who is not in a case position here. This is not a case position. But um, the specifier of TP is a case position. Uh, this is finite tense. It bears a nominative feature. So we can move from the caseless position to the case position. Uh, uh, now, again, this particular movement has no effect on the surface order because uh, we've moved it across a trace, which is a null element. And even if we hadn't, didn't have a trace here, we would have a null past. So uh, this movement is vacuous, but we do it in order to make sure that this DP meets the constraints that we've otherwise motivated. Um, this DP down here gets case by virtue of the fact that it's a complement to the V, uh, and this is an accusative case position. So the case filter is met provided we do this vacuous movement that has no effect on the surface order. Uh, this uh, movement that we just did also means that we satisfy the EPP. Uh, right, so this, uh, this element is in the specifier of the TP. Uh, the EPP says the specifier of TP in English must be filled. Okay, our last movement, uh, which is again vacuous, it doesn't actually shift the order, um, has to do with this plus WH feature. Now this is motivated, this feature here on the complementizer is motivated not by the surface order of elements, but by virtue of the fact that we want to type this clause as being a WH question. So that's what this little guy is doing here. But it's going to need to be near a WH element. So in other circumstances, for example, when this DP was a question word, we would have moved this element into the specifier position. So there was an element, um, a question element in this position. But in this sentence, uh, the question element is the subject. We move it here. Again, we're moving it past a null element, so there's no obvious shift in word order. But doing this movement makes sure that we're meeting all the constraints that we've otherwise motivated. So our surface order um, is who um, baked waffles, which is exactly the same as what it was at the deep structure, but we have all these extra movements that have gone on. So if you like to think of it this way, in fact, the sentence is who passed trace, 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 null voice baked beef waffles. That might disturb you a little bit. But the, the surface order uh, is, is in fact maintained, even though you have all these null items. And this is a well-formed S structure because all the features are checked and all the constraints are met.